Ben Heckman writes in here, our Pennsylvania State coordinator. Thank you so much. And Ben and I have been going back and forth on this uh, about the numbers and the real threat here. So I've, I've been really appreciating the conversation that Ben and I have been having. Ben writes, is socialism just when the government does stuff or is it when the workers seize the means of production? So in, in order to answer this question, you know, I turned off my hotspot. I want to pull up the dictionary. Can you pull up on your phone? The, no, I want to hold this one on that one. Pull up the dictionary definition of socialism. Because I, I want, this is a matter of being precise with language and interpretation. You know, I don't want to just be like, well, my, and, and actually this is, this is really good that we're having these conversations around terminology. You know, a lot of times libertarians get criticized for being pedantic, but it's, well, defined terms. If, if two people meet on the street today and they want to debate, is capitalism good or bad? And one of them's definition of capitalism is peace and freedom and the ability to earn money for an individual. And the other person's definition of capitalism is wars funded by corporations and central banks. You go, well, fuck, you're debating totally different things. You're talking past each other. You're not going to have a conversation. So socialism, precisely defined, is a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Now, this begs a lot of different questions questions and definitions of the words in this definition, right? So political and economic theory of social organization, I don't think we have to tease that part out, right? That's pretty clear. Uh, the means of production, distribution, and exchange. Now, this is something that, that you could have two different definitions of, and I, I, this is something that I use in explaining, you know, how I talk about capitalism, which, you know, production, means of production, distribution, and exchange are sometimes narrowly defined in traditional economic terms as things that are counted in dollars or can be measured as factories or property separate from people. And it doesn't include what, what I think is a much more accurate way of describing this as, you know, the individual human being. And this is the most important part. You can, I, mean, I have all these other things that I want to include kind of as abstract concepts, but even in the, in the way that things are measured in dollars, the, the individual human being is really severely devalue because you don't have the proper valuation of the individual in this matrix of assessment as the ultimate means of production, the individual human mind, the human body. Like they don't count that the same way in most analyses of mainstream economics. So distribution and exchange, you have similarly analysis, similarly analyzed. Now should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Now, here's where things get kind of tricky, right? In the way that I've come to define community as a voluntary association. The problem is when you say socialism as a political theory, now you're not really talking about a community. You're talking about the collective victims of a specific government, right? A, a country. So when it's that and saying that ownership should be of a national concept or, or a greater force collective, then we can say, absolutely not, socialism is wrong. In a sense, as a political theory, socialism is absolutely wrong. It is ethically wrong because it violates the rights of the individual to own property, including yourself. It's a form of communally justified slavery. That is inherently wrong by any definition of ethics. But I want to give the socialists a little loophole here. Right. If you if you say it's not a political and economic theory or you define that a little more, you define political and economic theory more broadly in terms of your aesthetic preference. Right. Of what you want your community or society to look like. And you accept the ethical premise that, that you, whatever system you develop can't be forced on anybody. You, you can't violate anybody's rights. You can't hold anybody captive. You can't steal from anybody to create that system. Right. If that's if that's baked into your definition and a community is not defined in a political sense as everybody who falls under a system that they're forced into 
as a national government system, but a community as, as I define it, as you know, people who choose to live together based on shared values and shared needs and decide to create community systems that could be described as voluntary government, then I'm all for it. I, I mean, maybe not for myself, right? I mean, I, you could say that, you know, we have, uh, you know, here at the, the sovereign kingdom of the Garden of Freedom, or Gardenia for short, you can you can refer to me as the king of Gardenia. Uh, my, my, my wife is the queen of Gardenia. And uh, the, the, we, we have longer formal titles, but we'll get to those when we make them up. Um, so, you know, the, 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 we, we have a concept here where, you know, are things owned or regulated by the community as a whole? Some things are, you know, we, I, as the owner of this property have made certain things communal and say that like control of this space or use of these tools are, are and, and that I, even as the property owner, allow for some regulation by the community of people who live here where, you know, we all kind of talk, we decide on the rules. Do, am I a socialist? Well, most families operate on similar principles. In fact, to be fair, most family units in the great free capitalist America are communists from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Yeah, pure communism at the family level, but clearly a voluntary unit. So to answer the question, is socialism bad or is socialism good? It's good when it's engaged in as a voluntary means that serves people. It's bad when it's anything that's forced on people. So to Ben Heckman's question, is socialism just when the government does stuff? Again, you could have voluntary socialism with or without an institution that you call a government, or is it when workers seize the means of production? And here's a whole other loaded question that gets to an, a very important point of righteousness behind modern socialism that we as libertarians ignore at our own peril. The socialists are correct to point out that the means of production have largely been illegitimately seized by corporations in cahoots with governments and banks. They have been stealing from individuals through governments, through taxation, through limiting our economic rights for as long as they have existed. A libertarian concept of property rights acknowledges this injustice and provides for the correction. As we bankrupt governments in localization, we can take back what has been stolen from us. I am all for redistribution of wealth when it's done in the name of justice, taking back stolen property and giving it to its rightful owners. And this is where socialists and libertarians should stand firm together, not just on so many issues that anybody who looks at politics and economics from a perspective of being well-intentioned and, and with intellectual integrity can, can acknowledge like, yes, the drug war is wrong. Yes, warfare is wrong. like the warfare state, military. There's a reason we as just honest intellectuals agree on these things. But there's another bridge to be made here and that's acknowledging what has been stolen from us and saying that we must unite to take it back. All right, so there we go. Thank you, Ben Heckman. Yes. Uh, any other? Sorry. Now that now that Jim has not been able to read comments, Jim, are there any other comments that you needed to, to okay. share? I'm gonna need a few minutes to top up, so let's move over to CJ, and then I'll check back. Right All right, Mr. Abernathy from South Dakota. Any producer house today? Adam, I have a question for you, sir. It's more of a gotcha. Um, uh, do you know how many Americans in the United States play video games? Most. It's a lot. You sent me this earlier today, and the exact number escapes me. But people have uh, done, presented this to me different. I, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm a gamer. I'm just really embarrassingly simplistic in it. Mike, like, this is this is embarrassing to, to to even admit. I play two dots right now. That's like my space out, mindless I distraction game. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just it's like this little just visual. It's fun. I, like if you want that, it's fine. Um, I play words with friends to connect with my mom and my brother, which for those of you who don't know, is like online Scrabble. And I play chess. I play chess on my phone and I haven't in person. 
we should start playing chess here. Like just put up actually, you know, that's something we should we should think about building into the courtyard is a, a table specifically for chess. That would be that would be very cool. Um but yeah, what and you've you've got it. I see you've got it pulled up here. What is it? Yeah, yeah. more than 150 million Americans. There you go. I said more than half. It's less than half, but barely. I guess Ryan, less than half. But it's more. It's, it's got to be more than half of uh, adults and young adults. So, That's close. It's 150 million out of 330 million. CJ's going somewhere with this for producer notes. Yes, sir. So, uh, as the producer of Adam versus the Man, I would like to announce that this show is not only moving to two hours starting next week, but it will also be moving over to Twitch and mixer and we'll be broadcasting daily on twitch and mixer as uh i realize that a lot of gamers uh are paying attention to presidential races and they believe that they can decide this election so why not broadcast on a platform or two platforms that uh, most americans are already engaging with so that's some exciting news and that's pretty much all i got today sir all right, Jim, cut okay. up on comments. Cut up on comments. Uh, there's one question here that stood out to me that you might be able to answer quickly. Ride with me, thirty-eight. Would you consider the Freedom Ranch a commune? No. Um, this is this is a sovereign kingdom. There you go. And and I I actually mean that. And we're developing the. And I, I say some of the things about that jokingly. But it's uh, there. Are, I encourage everybody to look up the terms micro state and micro nation, and I'll give you guys a sneak preview of, of something I'm I'm working on as a excuse me the side project here, where um, we're, we we park the website the United Na or no United Nations of Freedom dot com, and it's a way for developing countries such as the Garden of Freedom or the Sovereign Kingdom of the Garden of Freedom, uh, to use its one of its titles, um, or Gardenia, if you, if you want to be, you know, and use the shorthand version. And just because it sounds nice to say King and Queen of Gardenia. It's, they're royal. Their royal highnesses. Um, but no, is it, is it a commune? No, this is... So in, in the uh, political legal sense, yes, this is a sovereign, this is a sovereign kingdom. This is, this is a, in a singularly owned by me, individual sovereign nationality or na nation state. Um, we are a, a member state, and, and again, we're developing this, of the United Nations of Freedom, and that is a system where uh, anybody anywhere in the world, we, we are actually better than the United Nations in a sense, not only because we like freedom, uh, but because we are offering member state status to any any national governments that assert the non-aggression principle and um that that could be you know any from from as big as the biggest to down to you know uh one dude and and well I, I don't know if we would do one dude in his apartment we want to go uh, if you need to have land it's so uh, you have to have you actually have to have a territory yeah you can't just yeah you have to have a piece of land at least but that you could declare your sovereignty and nationhood status on that and so the the united nations of freedom will not just offer member state status but also individual citizenship so you can be a world citizen of the united nations of freedom and there are actually similar projects to that which have been done where they issued world passports that have worked look up world passport do we figure out this guys i remember watching the documentary at freedom fest like two years ago it's it's a real there's a really cool documentary about this. I can't believe it's it's slipping my mind right now. But if you look at World Password, if you really want to get into this, uh, you know, look at micro nations and micro states, different concepts. But um, being able to have people band together and assert their sovereignty. So you know, I maintain my dual citizenship. I, I I've declared the Garden of Freedom a sovereign kingdom. Um, I, I I am the sovereign ruler here as, as the King of Gardenia. Uh, I am a citizen then of this this nation state, and we are going to be offering citizenship of this as well. And that's a separate thing where, it, in order to be a citizen of the the Garden of Freedom, we have you, know, you have to negotiate with the king and say, yeah, "I'm coming on and under these terms," and you know, your citizenship can be revoked arbitrarily by me at any time. But if uh, 
if you, if you want to characterize then what is this is it a commune no it's a homestead uh it, it, it that, that so that's the legal framework of, of of what we have here as as to what is it in functionality it's a homestead it's a a, a place of business for myself and for people who want to work with me here uh it, it's but it's it's the land that i've bought in order to have my space to do everything that i want and and i'm the king here and I, I want everybody to have this. And I think while we can pursue localization politically, uh, which is the, this is the, the, the actual bottom up version of my top down strategy to, to which, and you know, I've, so I've never thought of it this way because I've been criticized with what I'm suggesting in localization, you know, that we're going to elect someone who's going to dismantle the federal government. This is the, this is the top down solution. And I, I, I've kind of resisted that intellectually to say, well, no, this really is the bottom up solution. Get get rid of the top, you know, get rid of the top so that the bottom can flourish. Um, but it is, in a sense, procedurally top down. And in that sense, this is the perfect bottom up counterpart to like, why wait? Why wait for government? Why wait for the federal government to go away or collapse? And for state governments to collapse and for county governments to be sovereign and then city governments and then break off and say, well, I'm that do it now, do it now, just do it now. And, and, and what we're doing is creating this legal framework that is a way to assess your rights or assert your rights. And it's with a good sense of humor. I mean, part of it is tongue in cheek and over the top to say, look how silly it is when people just declare that they're sovereign as the federal government of the United States of America claims to be a sovereign entity, right? Um, I mean, some would say, no, it's the United States, the states are the sovereigns, and it really should be, you know, a, re a republic that way. Obviously, it's not. They claim sovereign rights. And it really is, you know, I'm going to put on a, so maybe I'll be busting out my Sergeant Freedom, you know, uh, suit again. Maybe I got to take this, I got to take the Sergeant Chevrons off. So it is now my official dress regalia as the, the, as King of Gardenia, the, the sovereign, uh, kingdom of the garden of freedom.